Welcome to TechSoup Talks. Today's webinar is Tech Training Made Simple with Online Videos. We have Stephanie Gerding, Leela Fever, Mary Beth Piccioli, and Carolyn Blatchley. I'd like to introduce Stephanie Gerding who works for TechSoup. And uh, Stephanie, tell us a little bit about yourself and introduce the, the other presenters. Thank you, Cami. I'm Stephanie Gerding, and I'm a library consultant and author. I present workshops around the country and online on grants, training, and technology topics. And I'm currently working with the TechSoup for Libraries program to support them in providing technology education to libraries and helping libraries save money through the TechSoup stock software donations. So I'm going to be interviewing Lee today from Common Craft to learn more about their videos and how they're created. And then we'll hear from Mary Beth and Carolyn on how they're using the videos to support the needs in their community. So why don't you all go ahead and introduce yourself. We'll just go in order of our photos. So we'll start with Lee. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, hi, my name is Lee Lefever, Um And uh, my wife Sachi and I run uh, Common Craft, and we make videos. And uh, we'll be talking more later about uh, the process we use to make the videos and a little bit about our history. Great. And Mary Beth? Thanks, Stephanie. I'm Mary Beth Ficcioli with the Colorado State Library. And uh, the State Library here in Colorado provides resources and services to libraries across the state. In my position, I do a lot of um, training uh, material design for online environments. I also work with librarians to develop training and training materials. Uh, in addition to that, I produce webinars, much like this one, although not as big as this one, but uh, do that for the State Library for trainings and meetings. And um, do a bunch of web design and development, and also have started to get my hand in on working with audio and video to create training material and also for um, promotions for the State Library. Great. Thank you. And Carolyn. Thanks, Stephanie. This is Carolyn Blatchley. I'm the Training Services Coordinator at the Cumberland County Library System, and that's located in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. I'm talking to you from my home in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania right now. Um, what I do as Training Services Coordinator is I'm responsible for development, implementation, and evaluation of a public services uh, tra staff training program system-wide. I focus mostly on strengthening the information technology skills of our staff. And um, I'm a department of one, so I'm always looking for free and high quality resources that I can share out easily, um, anything that will promote excellent customer service and the best trained staff that we can have. Great. Thank you, everyone. Well, um, we're really excited about this webinar today. We have we had over 200 people sign up, and from looking at registrations, we see we have people from libraries, from schools, and from all types of different nonprofits. And I think one thing that we really have in common is just trying to figure out how to explain technology in plain English, which is what Lee is specializing in. And so, Lee, why don't we start by having you just tell us a little bit about the story behind how you started your company. Yeah, sure. I'm happy to. Um, uh, for those of you that, that might not be familiar with Common Craft, uh, we're a, a small company in Seattle, and we make videos that are usually about three minutes long, and we take something complex and, and make it easy to understand. And our brand is, is in plain English. Our videos are like wikis in plain English. Um, the story of how we got started is uh, I was an online community manager from about 1999 to 2003. And, uh, I started Common Craft in 2003 to do consulting for, with companies about online communities. And I always ran into the same kind of problems, and that was that the people that I was working with and, and hoping to influence lacked a really basic understanding of, of what was happening on the web in terms of the social side of the web, you know, RSS and wikis and blogs. And at the time I wrote blog posts about it, you know, normal text, and called them in plain English and uh, shared them with my clients and put them on the blog and, and, and enjoyed the process but never really thought much about it. And then when, uh, when uh, YouTube got really popular in 2006 and uh, Sachi joined the company, we started to think about how can we use video as a part of what Common Craft does. And we had the idea of, of turning those old blog posts into videos. And, and for a while I uh, tried to be the guy standing in front of a whiteboard with a marker uh, trying to draw and look at the camera at the same time, and that, it didn't really work very well. Um, 
Uh, and then Sachi, my wife, had the idea of, of pointing the camera down onto a whiteboard and using hands and markers and paper cutouts to tell a story. And in April of 2007, we, we did that and made our first video, RSS in plain English, which is still one of our most, most popular ones. Um, we didn't do it with a real business model in mind so much. It's just something fun that we thought it needed to be done. It was something that RSS was a, sub a subject that we felt had an explanation problem. And by that, we thought that you know, RSS is something that's free for people to use. It could impact almost everybody that uses the web, but it's not being adopted in part because it's not explained very well. And the web is full of those things, but RSS was one that we felt, um, uh, felt strongly about at the time. Uh, since then, we've made a lot of videos about, uh, about more things than just uh, technology, which we'll talk about later. Uh, but overall, we, right now we have about 26 videos in our library that, that we own that we've done uh, as educational materials. And through sites like YouTube, um, they've been viewed you know, millions of times, over 15 million now, I think, with Twitter and plain English being our, our big one. Um, so over time, like I said, that started in April of 2007, so we're getting close to be doing this for three years. We really made two kinds of videos. Um, the first is custom videos, and that's where organizations like Google or Microsoft hire us to make a video that explains their product. But um, that's not really the focus of the future of Common Craft. I think what, what, what we really want to do is make educational videos that we can, we can share online for consumers, but then license as educational materials for school systems and, and businesses as well. We have a really broad uh, client base in that way. Um, the, the idea of licensing came from uh, people writing us and saying, hey, can I use your – I'm doing a corporate training program in my business, or I want to put your – your video as a part of my training um, at school or work. And um, we said, well, maybe we can make uh, a premium version of these videos that is, that's delivered as a download so you don't have to have an Internet connection that skips the whole YouTube thing. So they said, wow, this is actually a business that maybe we can do. So now we're really focused on making a big collect having a big collection of videos on our website that can be viewed for free on the website but can also be uh, purchased in a licensing kind of relationship where you download a file and it's really high quality and you can use it, you have permission to use it in, you know, uh, for, for professional purposes. Um, right now we offer three basic licenses. Um, the individual one is for one person's use. So if, um, if there's a trainer, let's say, that just wants a video to use in that person's training session wherever they're doing it, or a presentation for instance, the individual license is perfect. Site licenses for you can, something you can share with everyone in an organization. Everybody can, can use it. It can be posted on an intranet. It can be you know, used in multiple training situations. And um, we also offer one for, for public website use. So that's sort of embedding into a website, sort of like a YouTube video. Okay, great. Um, well, I'm really familiar with your technology subjects, but you have other ones as well? Yeah, that's right. Um, we got started in technology, and I think that technology is always going to be a big part of what we do. But we also feel strongly about other things, and, and one is, is money and, and financial responsibility. I feel like that – I noticed somebody said zombies on the thing. We have a zombies in plain English video too. Um, but <laughs> um, we're really focused on financial responsibility because I don't know about you, but when I was in high school and middle school, I wasn't really taught much about things like compound interest and, right. and how insurance works <laughs> and things like that. So we're really focused on creating materials that – help people understand those things as well. And we're also focused on green subjects and, and other sort of seemingly random subjects like electing a U.S. president. Great. Good. Um, well, I'm sure people are more interested also in the cost, so let's talk about that a little bit. Yeah, for sure, for sure. This has been something that, that we've done a lot of thinking about. And from the very beginning, we've always had a philosophy of being, of being kind to our, you know, our fans in libraries and schools. Um, we see it as a business opportunity, but also something that I feel like that we can make a meaningful contribution to um, outside, of, uh, outside of the cost. So our videos are free to watch, and they're free to link to. If you wanted to put a link in newsletters or any, on your website or anything like that, of course, that's, uh, that's definitely encouraged. Um, what we always say is that we, we, we want the videos to be open to anybody that wants to use them for non-commercial purposes. Of course, that includes uh, libraries and, and most work by nonprofits and, and things like that. And I know that there's a lot of folks here that are in libraries, and, and that, that's a place where I think we really do um, encourage them to use whatever's on YouTube. Um. Wow. <laughs> Lee, are you still there? Oh, that was strange. 
<laughs> okay, so uh, Lee must have gotten dropped off the call. I hope he realizes that. Um, we will jump back to him, but I think while we wait for him to come and finish his part of the presentation, Mary Beth, do you mind jumping in for a second to tell us a little bit about how you're using his videos? That would be just fine. Let me go ahead. Okay, great. Um, well, Mary Beth, I know you're using the videos in more of an online environment. So can you tell us how you're incorporating those? Sure. Um, what we're doing in Colorado is a version of the 23 things. And I know uh, many libraries already know about 23 things, but since we have so many other people on the call, I'll just describe briefly what this is about. Um, a librarian in North Carolina created an, uh, some years back an online learning program for library staff. The idea was that um, to teach Web 2.0 tools, a lot of library staff hadn't been able to keep up with the um, rapidly changing technology. And so this librarian, Helene Blowers, at the Public Library of Charlotte in Mecklenburg County developed uh, this online learning program that would take library staff through uh, different Web 2.0 tools, allow them to learn the tools, and um, these were self-directed asynchronous um, uh, le lessons. And the idea would be not only would they be able to apply them uh, in their library job, uh, they would be able to teach patrons who are coming in to use them also. They were seeing a lot of patrons coming in. How, how do I sign okay. up for Flickr? What is this? And so uh, this 23 Things idea was um, then repurposed by many libraries. and. Um, uh, but not all libraries have the resources to create such a thing. And so in Colorado, a group of continuing education librarians got together, and we have been building Colorado's version of the 23 things. And um, you can see listed here are some of the sample tools that we're using in our version. And um, you know, these are commonly used in many of the 23 things. Great. And can you show us how that looks for your Library. Sure. So here is an image of uh, one of the tools that we use. So um, this one is a photo sharing lesson, and the tool we're using is Flickr. And so we start out with a section called the what, and that has um, the concept of what this, this tool is about, what photo sharing is about. And here you can see how we're using Common Craft. It's just embedded right here on the web page. Um, so we really are interested in using Common Craft. I mean, I think everyone knows that these are just brilliantly done, and um, you know, I have to admit that I learned RSS from Common Craft. And um, hearing Lee talk about wanting to make a meaningful contribution, he, that's really happening in libraries. Thousands and thousands of library folks are learning about these tools from Common Craft. So, right. Um, yeah, I don't know if he knew how many groupies he has. Yeah, in it's, <laughs> they're really amazing. Um, but uh, in terms of uh, online learning, learning and trying to create uh, good learning materials, there are a few things about these videos that are really important. Um, the first thing is that uh, people can connect these to something that they already know. You, you can see in the picture here that there's somebody holding a digital camera, and so you know it's not just sort of a screenshot of a Flickr page and here's how you use it, but there's a story that's being told there. So that connection to what we already know, the, the Twitter video has somebody mowing the lawn and has an image of somebody cooking, and um, in the RSS video there's a there's an image of a person sitting in their house working on the computer, or looking at news, and this is something that we can all relate to, and that really helps learning to stick. And and uh, another thing that's also really important for um, learning to take hold is use of humor. And we all know from watching Common Craft videos that they're really funny, you know, right, from flicking right. pieces of paper off of the whiteboard and whatnot. So these are all reasons why um, we've wanted to use Common Craft videos um, to help explain what these concepts are. Great. Just a little more about um, what we're doing in our um, learning modules, in addition to the what section where uh, we're uh, explaining the concept behind these tools. Then we go on to include a section on the why. And in this section we're helping library staff who are taking these to relate it to their own environment. So again, we're working on that connection piece. Libraries are um, an environment that librarians know and library staff know, and then they're reading about this concept, um, the new uh, technology tool. And in this section of the why we're showing how it is that other libraries are using this tool um, for uh, really giving the full picture of 
Right. And then we go on from there to the house section where there's an experiential hands-on exercise. And also um, typically there's a reflection piece in there also. So the staff are getting the concept. Um, they're getting some connections to how libraries are already using that and then um, have the opportunity to go through and use the tool themselves. And we will provide a link in the follow-up email that, um, to this website so you can look at it some more. So Mary Beth, why do you really think that, that multimedia, using multimedia in your training is important? Well, just to uh, throw out a little bit of data, um, it's shown that over a text-based environment, and you know, I noticed that Lee mentioned in the beginning that In Plain English started in blogs and they were just text-based. Also, I think some of the 23 Things style learning programs also use a whole lot of text and not a lot of images. But mm -hmm. research shows that when you add multimedia, as in this Common Craft case, um, that recall and retention of the material goes up 42%, and that transfer to other environments uh, goes up 89%. And these are just um, huge whopping statistics. It's amazing um, to see these. So the idea being that you learn about something with this multimedia um, uh, component, and then you're able to transfer it to your unique environment. So it's, it's really stunning statistics for learning. Great. Thank you. Well, that's a great – have you read that book as well? The uh, not, but not fully. Okay. Yeah, I think that's one I definitely want to check out later as well. Okay. So thank you, Mary Beth. And I hear that we do have Lee back on the line. Are you there, Lee? I am here. Okay. Great. Okay. Oh. I'm not sure where I dropped off um, <laughs> on this slide. I kind of talked to myself for a little while, I think. Um, <laughs> I think we were just – Getting in, let's see, I know you talked about libraries being okay. And yeah, yeah, definitely. I think the, the kind of the message here is that we have, um, you know, our clients are, are both for-profit and non-profit, so our business model is, is oriented around, um, you know, selling our, our licensed videos, but we, we really take a, a light hand for, for libraries, so please don't feel like that we're going to worry about you guys using the free versions on YouTube. Um, and also, I wanted to really quickly let you know that we do have a discount code for libraries and nonprofits that you can use in the shopping cart. It takes 20% off of any purchase, and it's SD1920 um, here. Wonderful. So, okay, so can you tell us a little bit more about how you do what you do, what the process is? Yeah, sure, sure. Um, well, you know, it's a very uh, team-oriented process between Sachi and I. Um, we are a two-person company. And uh, you know, like a lot of things, we start with a script, and we feel like that that's really where um, the value that Common Craft provides really comes from is is the writing. And we spend a lot of time and do a lot of iteration on uh, on, on in the in the writing phase uh, of the script. And we try to think about telling a story and, and putting the viewer in, in in a world that they already understand, so they can see themselves in the video. Like, oh, I have that problem. And I think that's one of the big kind of insights about about what we do is context. Um, so here you see a script and then a, what we call a thumbnail storyboard. And I'm going to click over to this next one. And you can see where um, this is my little drawings here where we've um, taken the script and then for each scene just done a really basic representation of what would be in that scene uh, for that section of the script. And then over on the left, I've list, list, listed out the things that, I would, that we would need to draw in order to, um, to have the right uh, characters and things in the videos. Um, so this is kind of a first step is this really first storyboard. Great. Um, recently, I started using a Wacom tablet, and then maybe when Apple has their tablet coming out soon, I'll use that. But uh, it's a way to digitally draw um, our characters versus doing it on paper, which actually saves a lot of time. Mm -hmm. And it's something that I'm really excited about is using a tablet as a part of what we do. Um, and one of the things that we, we, we turn the storyboard, once we have the drawings done, we actually use PowerPoint to uh, set up a storyboard. So we digitize the images and make them into something you can insert into a slide and then create a PowerPoint presentation that has the script at the top and then the storyboard pages on the bottom. And you can see an example here on this page of what a scene would look like. And then when it comes time to make the video, we really actually hit print on the, on the PowerPoint <laughs> presentation and cut out the pieces of paper and color them for, wow. for the video. Great. And that also makes the storyboard easy to share. If we need to get feedback from someone, we can send them a PowerPoint presentation. And they get a pretty good feel for, for what's, uh, what the story that we're trying to tell. Um, in this example, this is just a, a shot of like all of, the, the, all of the paper materials that we put together to make the video um, electing a U.S. president. Great. So we, we take this into our studio and, and, and start assembling it on the board for each scene. Um, uh, 
a little joke. We just shot a video last night, and we use a lot of putty to paste things down on the board because things have to be very consistent. And if I had an assistant, that's what I would want to have them do is to put little pieces of putty on the pieces of paper because it takes so long. <laughs> <to do. laughs> you need a um, preschool class to help you out. <laughs> that's right. We called it a. We have a name for it. It's a putty a. There you go. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so um, this is what our studio looks like right now. Um, please okay, forgive the high yellow. Tech, high I'm tech sorry. Glimpse, a sneak peek at your high tech studio. Yeah, that's right. Our high tech homemade studio. <laughs> um, obviously, in a former nursery, um, the yellow and white walls. Um, but you can see here we have a camera hanging from the ceiling, uh, sunglasses. The lights are really bright, and I actually wear sunglasses when we're moving the pieces of paper around because it's so bright. Um, the, the screen here is hooked to the camera so you can see what's on the screen. Uh, so that helps a lot in us laying out what's on the video, what, what ends up in the video. Um, and obviously the, the whiteboard there. Um, Here's again our, our homemade sound studio with quilts and uh, clamps and hooks holding everything together. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, we feel really, I don't think we need all the, the big crazy um, infrastructure to do what we do, and we're happy about that. Great. Is that um, your wife in the photo? That is, that's Sachi. <laughs> that's Sachi. Reluctant model for that, I think. <laughs> um, so, in terms of actually m making the video, um, what we do is record the voice separate from the video, and then Sachi is our head, our chief editor, so she edits the voice part of it down to exactly what's going to be in the video. So we have that, and then we take the audio. We take the, the yeah, we take the the video. I'm sorry, I'm getting confused in audio and video. We put the voice track down to make it exactly what's going to be there, and then we put the video on top of it and edit the video to match the voice. And part of what we do is try to make the timing right as we do that. Um, and we use GarageBand for editing the audio, and we use Final Cut Express for editing the video and audio together to make the video. Okay, great. And uh, it's all available. Uh, you can see everything we've, we've done at, at CommonCraft.com and learn more about us and, and everything else. Um, and we're always happy to, to hear from you, too. I, I, don't guess there, I think there, there might be some contact uh, information in the, the email, but I'm Lee at CommonCraft.com. Okay, great. Well, Lee, we've had a few questions in the chat box, and if you have other questions, people that are listening, go ahead and type those in the chat box. We are keeping track of those. So, sure. you know, one thing that was asked is, do you use a condenser mic? <laughs> you know, this is going to show off my lack of real knowledge of a lot of stuff we do, but I'm not even sure if I know what a condenser mic is. <laughs> it's an Audio-Technica mic. Um, I know that. Um, but, yeah, I don't know that it's a condenser mic. Okay, you just know it works, huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and any other mixing software that you use? No, not really. I think um, we use a, a little program called Levelator that makes the sound uh, evened out, um, but really it's just GarageBand. Okay, and this is a question I think that came from when you were talking about cost and licensing. Yep. Someone asked if nonprofits also include higher education. Um, yes, in terms of the uh, the discount code. I'm not sure what. Yeah, exactly that might be something. If it's related to the discount code, then yes, um, that includes schools of all types. Okay, and Andy, if that didn't answer your question, just type in the chat again. Make sure that we answered that. All for free use. Um, yeah, Andy says free. Um, okay. Yeah, definitely. I think that that in the educational world in general, including libraries, nonprofits, we're we're less concerned about people using whatever's on YouTube. If it's on YouTube, then we really can't limit anybody's use. Um, we put it there to, to, for that reason and, to, and for our own sort of uh, marketing. We're really only concerned when a commercial organization is trying to use the videos to sell their product. Um, for education and things like that, you know, we would love it if you were customers, but um, you know, we, we put it out there so, so people can use it. Okay, great. And Jason asked what platform you use to offer the licensed version of the video for a fee. Interesting. Um, in terms of doing the digital downloads, which may be the question, we use a service called eJunkie. It's e-junkie.com, and that's a combination. Uh, and that, that also works with PayPal to do the, the credit card transactions. Oh, great. Okay. And Debbie's asked, is it possible for an academic library to purchase the videos on DVD and circulate them to the students? Um, that is a possibility. We don't currently offer the DVDs, but if you were to purchase a site license for the videos, then you would be free to distribute them via DVD to students. Okay, great. And let's see. 
Anne asked if you've met the folks from Fast Draw on CBS. <laughs> <laughs> no, we we do try to keep you know we do have relationships relationships with a lot of people that are sort of in the same uh, genre as we are, but well, I've not met those folks yet. Okay, and Patricia asked, can we suggest topics for free videos? Of course, of course, we always appreciate that. Um, yeah, our contact form on our website is always a good place for that, as well as like I said, Lee at CommonCraft.com. Okay, great. And um, someone also asked if you plan to translate the videos in other languages, and I think you've already done that with some of them, right? We have. Um, we are we're planning to do others uh, soon. We have our social media nine pack that's translated, and I think we're probably going to do our so our computer basics pack soon, which has six videos. Uh, and we do the five languages: you know, English, Spanish, French, uh, Portuguese, and German. Okay, great. And do you have any new videos that you're planning already? Yeah, I think that our Did focus over the next few night. yeah our, fo our focus over the next few months I think is going to be um, net safety. Um, so we've done a, a video called "Phishing Scams in Plain English," which hopefully helps people understand how to react to those emails they get that try to get them to put their password in there. Um, we're yeah, I, watch, I actually watched that one today, and I was thinking I need to forward it on to yeah. my, <laughs> my in-laws. And <laughs> yeah, yeah. We I think that there's a lot a lot we plan to do there. An example is. Uh, secure websites, understanding what it means to have a secure website and how to tell. Okay. Another example is helping mainly younger people understand the consequences of what they put on something like P Facebook in terms of pictures of people drinking and things like that. Okay, great. <laughs> and do you have any timeline, like how often you come up with something? or? We try to publish a video, one video a month. Um, this year I think we'll probably have done 14 or 15 of our own videos uh, over the course of the year. Okay, great. And can you do widgets? <laughs> um, you know, we haven't looked at that very closely. I think that could be a possibility for the future, but we don't have current plans. Okay, great. And Mary Ann's asked about tips for trainers who are listening on simplifying tech for our students. Yeah. I think that's something you're so great at, those <laughs> analogies. Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, I think that one of the things that, and I mentioned, I mentioned this a little bit before, but one of the things that we really believe in is uh, telling a story. You know, not just uh, using bullet points and sort of tactical click here kinds of things, but, but telling a story that allows someone to see themselves in the story. Mm -hmm. And then making them say, oh, that's me, and then presenting that, that, that character with a problem that makes the viewer say, oh, I have that problem. And then when you present the solution, the solution makes a lot more sense to them. Okay. Um, that so that is really basic outline of the way we look at our videos. Okay, that was a great last question, and we're going to move on. If we have some time left and we have new questions come up, then Lee, we'd like to hear back from you then. Of course. Thank you Thanks. so much. And so now we're going to talk with Carolyn from the Cumberland County Library System in Pennsylvania. And she's been using the Common Craft uh, videos a little differently, more in person workshops, which you know, it's always interesting to have a speaker, and I think Carolyn kind of managed to do that by using Lee as her co-presenter. So <laughs> Carolyn, can you tell us about how you've been using those videos? Oops, I went too far with the slides, I think. Okay. Um, thank you. I, uh, that was a perfect, perfect explanation of what I did, Stephanie. I had been asked by Commonwealth Libraries to do a presentation, uh, just a one-hour training presentation, to people who had little, little or no experience with Web 2.0 applications. They were actually friends and trustees of libraries. So um, they had some specific objectives, and you can see those on, on the slide here, RSS feeds, blogs, wikis, social networking sites, photo sharing sites, and social bookmarking sites. Uh, they wanted to learn all about these. They wanted to know what each one was, where they could get started using selected tools, and they also wanted to see examples of these tools being used effectively by libraries. And when I saw Marianne Lennox's question on there about simple, simplifying tech for our own students, um, this is kind of where I was. I had people who had little to no knowledge at all of these tools. They knew they existed, um, and they needed to start at the very beginning. And so I worked up a, a PowerPoint slide show that I did with them, and there was a, quite an introduction describing what Web 2.0 is as a concept, and then I mentioned that you know, here are some of the primary tools we're going to learn about today. And I would begin by introducing the concept 
through a video, I would just very briefly say, you know, next we're going to learn RSS, which stands for Really Simple Syndication. And while I could go on and on and on and tell you about it, and I didn't tell them this, but my big fear was I may miss a few points. Um, <laughs> yeah, I said, you know, I'm going to have my co-presenter, Lee Lefevre. I, I know you can't see him in the room, but here, here he is. And I would click on that link, and the YouTube videos would come on, and, um, and I would show the video. Um, I did the workshop a couple of times, so it provided a lot of consistency in my message. Mm -hmm. Again, not having to remember to say all the same things. Um, the videos are so short, but they, they get all the main points out there. Um, and they really do simplify the concept for everyone in a fast-paced, humorous, and memorable fashion. And people really caught on to the style of um, uh, to Lee's style. I actually noticed in the tweets that uh, Stephanie Zimmerman said that she loves the yay and the boo. And I said, every, you know, everybody does. Um, people were yaying and booing by the by the sixth video. They were going right along with him, right on cue. They knew. Oh, that's great. Yeah, they they just they loved his style. And there, and there were a few other quirky little things that they caught right on to. So that was super. Um, so the humor really made a big impact and um, kept it kept it fresh and alive for them. And then I followed up that video with um, a couple of bullet points that would reiterate mostly points that were made in the video. Some of these I related straight back to libraries. Um, and one of the things that is done in each of the Common Craft videos on technology anyway on the Web 2.0 applications is um, best sites are given out. So. Um, so I put on some of the most ubiquitous sites. They aren't all straight from the videos. Some of them were my own. Um, but here you can see an example of where I gave um, sites for free RSS feed readers. Mm -hmm. um, another slide would, again, reiterate some of the points made in the Common Craft video, but also move into practical application for the people that I was training. So for the specific um, audience, I put in you know, that they might want to, I guess these would apply to other nonprofits as well, but calendar of events, um, latest new, uh, news items and newsletter articles, that sort of, these were ways that you could, or things that you could feed um, to reiterate what he taught there. And then finally, I followed up with, um, with best practices for common real world examples of uh, Web 2.0 applications that were being used in libraries. So each time I did the presentation, I tailored the sites so that they either matched the geographical or the topical interest of the audience. And for every one of these presentations, I gave a handout. And on that handout, I had uh, not a whole lot of information, but one of them was a link to a wiki where people could go back and watch the Common Craft videos. They could find the links that were given in the Common Craft videos, and they could find the best, the best sites again. Wonderful. Thank you for sharing how you did that. Sure. I think that's a great um, way to really incorporate those into your workshops. Um, we have a couple of other examples that I'll just talk about really quickly. And one is from the University of Minnesota. and. Um, you can see in the upper right-hand corner of this website that they've got a link to the Google Docs in plain English. And Denise Gamble shows how they have incorporated the um, videos really in a lot of different ways, using them in person workshops. They've included the links to the videos in emails to staff, just trying to educate them that way quickly. And they've also linked it to in-house online training modules, and then they've used it one-on-one -on -one too. So really using it in a lot of different ways to help train their staff. And then this last example is from the Idaho Commission Libraries. And Shirley Billadu um, shared this one with us, which I think is a great example. This is SPLAT, which stands for Special Projects Library Action Team. And so they've really used the videos as part of a self-paced online course and focus on six different technology-based resources like blogs and wikis. And so again, really incorporated the Common Craft videos into their training. 
And I think one thing that's really important about looking at these videos, I know some people have questions and are thinking about making their own videos, and I think one of the things about Lee is he makes it seem like it's really an easy thing to do, but I've tried to do some of this myself, and it's really true that the post-production takes a lot of time. And I know one of the questions in the chat, Lee, someone asked, how long does it take to shoot one of the three-minute videos? Can you answer that question? <laughs> You know, the actual <laughs> shooting, and like I said, we just did one last night. Um, it, it, if we were to sit and just do it the whole time, it would take about four to five hours um, to, to, shoot it, to shoot it. And that's not counting doing the voiceover or editing. Okay. Um, to and do a whole video, that's right. another question that people have is like, what about a whole video from start to finish? And each one is different, um, and there's, we iterate so much, and, and also kind of working from home. Uh, our work and home life sort of gets wrapped up together, so it's really hard to yeah. know, but we estimate maybe 80 hours or 100 hours or something for a video. Wow, that's amazing. It's a lot. And of course, <laughs> it also takes a lot of storage space up. Um, that's something I've seen as well. Some of those audio files can get really, and video files can get really huge. So I think this is a great thing that you've provided to us that we can just use your videos instead. <laughs> <laughs> and you've already got your studio set up, so you've got your good audio as well. Um, we just wanted to share a little bit about some best practices, and I think Mary Beth um, gave us this slide. If you want to talk for a second, Mary Beth, about training best practices. Sure. I um, just wanted to talk a little bit about um, some things as a trainer that you might want to be thinking about when you're uh, working with staff with these sorts of um, technology trainings and other kinds of trainings. The first thing is related to content, and you want to be able to provide an environment for staff um, in addition to physical environment, like you, know, you want to make sure that the person is not disturbed, et cetera, when they're working on this sort of self-directed learning. But also you probably want to be working with your IT department and make sure that staff have access to the things that they need. Um, I know that sometimes people aren't able to have access to YouTube videos, for example, and things like this. And I think it's important as a trainer to actually try to relate with IT um, on these things and you know, talk about what, uh, what's valuable about this and you know, why it would be that staff would, should be able to, for example, download an application in order to learn it, and et cetera. Um, also in terms of content, just su supporting and mentoring staff when they have questions and then um, helping them with some sort of reflection piece, some kind of assessment. In addition, I think as a, as a trainer or manager, uh, creating opportunities for staff to apply what they've learned and supporting that application in the workplace is important. So not just look at the video, figure out how this works, look at how other uh, organizations might be using, but, using it, but actually taking it into the workplace and applying it in work and, and doing that soon after somebody takes the, the training and so that um, they're able to apply it right away and it, and it makes some sense. People will tend to forget if they're not applying it pretty soon. And then also really good practice is to allow staff to share what they've learned and for you as a trainer or manager to facilitate that sharing out. And so whether that's that you have um, staff do a brown bag about what they've learned or create a tip sheet or something something like this, but um, somehow allow them to um, share and, and, and teach it themselves, and that really helps to um, make learning stick. Great. Thank you, Mary Beth. And Carolyn, did you have anything you wanted to share too? I did have some, some best practices here for they, – they really were for in-person training, but they also work very well with um, online training, with providing some kind of asynchronous learning. Um, the, the Training best practices identified were defining the competencies. First, making sure that you know what people need to learn, um, what's going to be the outcome of, of the work that you're doing with them. And then scaffolding, uh, which is a term I use for starting where the learner is or where the majority of the learners are. Mm -hmm. And um, if they are at a very basic level or absolutely don't know anything about the subject, um, this is where, again, those Common Craft videos really came into play as a great introduction um, to start where my learners were. Then through differentiated instruction, providing diversity to your training so that there's a little bit of video, maybe a little bit of group work, maybe some individual thought, some writing, um, providing them different ways to learn because obviously everyone learns differently. And project-based learning is really important for reinforcing uh, the points. 
people enjoyed watching the videos. People um, appreciated the amount of information they were given, but they needed a task at the end. So, and and in most cases, they do. So they need something to um, to do something hands-on that reinforces everything that they've learned. Wonderful, thank you. And you've also got some resources for training videos as well. I do. I think this is a combination of things that um, Mary Beth and I both right. submitted. Great. And so some of them were they were just. I know the ones I put in here were great resources for other videos. Some of them not quite as simplistic. Some of them not in plain English. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but <laughs> some, but some, they were some of, some of our favorite places to go to get videos that you could show in full or in part. Some of them come with um, handouts that can help reinforce the learning. I don't know, Mary Beth, do you have anything more you want to share about them? Yeah, I will just mention that um, SchoolTube and a, a lot of the content in SchoolTube is geared, I think, more toward a K-12 environment. But SchoolTube tends to be one of, a, a video site that is not blocked by organizations where YouTube often is. Because, and th these videos on SchoolTube are considered safe. They're sort of vetted for content. Um, the Merlot site, I know for, for those who are uh, in working in library environments and who are wanting uh, to develop training material for database searching or information literacy and, and things like this, the Merlot website has a lot of training material that's actually peer-reviewed that people have already created. And this is you know, for online teaching, which you, again, you can use that in a face-to-face -face environment just with a computer, um, but might be something that folks want to check out. And you know, the other ones there are pretty self-explanatory. But um, you know, I think that in, in the library world especially, we're really good at um, reinventing. And a lot of times we might not have to. And so I think, um, as, as you mentioned, Carolyn, it's a good idea to kind of see what's out there and see what it is that you incorporate because um, you know, we don't have the resources to be always doing this ourselves. You know, one, this is, sorry. Oh, I, I was just going to say that the one um, that if anybody's been following along on the chat, um, BNET got taken off the list. It's kind of at the last minute. We're, I think we're going to add that back on. Um, that's one that has, again, very, they're under four minutes. Um, things like email, missteps, and Flash and um, Hulu and different things that um, some of them are some of them are technology oriented and some of them are personal interaction oriented. Yeah. Uh, you know, Virginia mentioned um, TeacherTube in the in the chat. That's one one that's much like SchoolTube. And I think in both cases, if your if your school or library or organization uh, is, has YouTube blocked and maybe blocks similar sites. If you contact SchoolTube or TeacherTube, they can send you materials that you can give to tech administrators or whomever sort of holds those strings uh, to, that gives them their policies and what they need to do to be able to open up uh, those video resources. Okay. Oh, that's great to know. Yeah. Okay, good. Well, thank you for sharing those resources, everyone. And I think we have a few minutes for questions. So if you have any questions for any of our presenters, you can just type them in the chat. And I did have one for Lee from Garrett. He asked, have you ever received feedback regarding the pace of your videos and their effectiveness on different age groups? Um, you know, we have heard feedback about that. And I think that uh, if, you, if you look at one of our more recent videos compared to our early, early videos like RSS, wikis, social networking, um, we have tried to slow down the pace more. Um, I think that young learners are one thing, but also um, our, our videos are often used for teaching English as a second language. And that's another oh, wow. thing that, that we try to slow it down some for. Um, and, you know, and something you might notice too is if you compare uh, the version of U RSS in plain English, for instance, on YouTube to what we show on commoncraft.com, we've actually redone the audio to make it a little bit, more slow, a little bit slower. Okay, great. And let's see, Debbie's asked if you or if anyone else on the call has um, used geneproject.com to create vi free videos of screenshots. Well, I have used Jing some. I, uh, I primarily use Adobe Captivate, and I've also used Camtasia, but I know uh, a lot of my colleagues use Jing, and they use it because it's freeware. And so, um, but that's, that's often good for doing the um, screencasting type um, the training, online training. Was there a, 
and it looks like some other folks in the chat have also used um, Jing. Was there a particular question that you had about, or you're just recommending it? It looks like Stephanie is recommending Jing as, a, as an online um, a tool to create online training. I think it's a great idea. Yeah. Yeah, that came out just shortly after we bought Captivated our library system, and I evaluated it and thought, if I'd known then what I know now. <laughs> um, yeah, I think isn't it the, like the free version of Camtasia? I yes, it is, and it's um, you know I think when you uh, sometimes you get what you pay for, and so some of the um, the ones that cost have a, have a little more in the way of features. But I think that you know if you're on a um, on a budget and you have to pick and choose where your resources are, I, I think it's fantastic. And, and that's really great if you have something very specific that you need to create at your own at your own business place, your own library. Um, but again, I, when I heard Lee say, I wrote that down. Eighty hours it takes him to to do yeah. a video. <laughs> yeah, and that's I thought, two, you know, that's, Oh, sorry. <laughs> and well, in terms of staff time, that's you know that's two weeks of work. Um, and so it's really important to sit down and evaluate: is it something you need to create yourself? Or is there something free and handy out there and perhaps done more professionally than you could possibly do it? Yeah, and I don't I, I want to stress too that that's uh that's two people's time doing it. Sachi and wow. you both. <laughs> no, I'm not so it's not hundred and sixty, I'm saying that's uh total man hours, let's oh, say. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so across both of our times and that it varies a lot. But yeah, there's a lot of things that we do that I don't think are necessary for everybody to do in making a video. I think that that's um part of sort of our business. <laughs> is just is uh, taking it to a to a kind of a different level, I guess, because we're trying to you know, make a business out of what we do, I guess, versus just getting the message across. Great. I also saw a comment from Marianne Lennox that she asked, "Can can somebody please write the accidental instructional designer?" <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to write that book. I'll get on that right away. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> We'll talk later. I have an editor. I can hook you oh, up. Oh, excellent. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Any other questions? I know there's a lot of going on in the chat sharing different platforms that people have used and pros and cons. Any other questions for our presenters? Okay. Well, I thank all of you. This has been a really great and fun webinar. And um, I do want to reiterate that these slides will be, you will get an email that will have um, an attachment of the PowerPoint and the links that we've talked about and also a link to the archived version. And I think that's about all of our questions. So Kimmy, do you want to go ahead and talk a little bit about other webinars coming up and how we can continue these great conversations? Certainly. We actually don't have any upcoming webinars planned set in stone, so I can't uh, really share that information. But a uh, link to the page on the TechSoup site where you can find this information is TechSoup.org forward slash go forward slash webinars. And that link, of course, will be in the follow-up email. But I did want to talk about some previously recorded TechSoup webinars that are somewhat related to this topic. In the question that you all answered, what are you hoping to gain from this webinar, people are talking about podcasting and making videos and um, how do I get the word out. And we've done webinars that talk about these topics and, and other people wanted to do webinars themselves. So here is a list of some of the webinars we've done that are directly tied to this overall idea. And there will be links to these webinars in the follow-up message. They're all 60 minutes long, they're all free, and they're all set up in the same kind of format. So um, along with the webinar are links to more information. So one question someone had was, where do I find music that I can include in my video? And in one of the webinars that we did, there's a link uh, to the different places where you can find free or royalty-free music for your videos. So I haven't uh, been seeing if there's additional questions that have come through the chat, but if we didn't answer your question, and if you have more questions that you'd like to ask of the presenters or about this topic, then let's uh, create that conversation on our TechSoup community forums. And I'll include this link in the follow-up message. But this uh, tiny URL goes to a topic that I started uh, just for this webinar. 
So a little bit more about TechSoup for those of you who may be new to TechSoup and this is your first webinar or you're not sure what we do. We have discounted software donations from Microsoft, Adobe, Symantec to name a few. They donate their software to us and we redistribute it to nonprofits and libraries at a greatly discounted price. We also have articles in our Learning Center that talk about different technology topics. And we have a section for free downloads. And of course our webinar, the webinar program is listed in the Learning Center. And our community forums is a great place to post your questions, whatever they may be, and have them answered by volunteers who watches those questions. We list upcoming events, and we also have a special website just for libraries. So TechSoup for Libraries is a place where you can download one of three uh, Maintain IT cookbooks, which are a really fantastic uh, resource for organizations with public computers. And I wanted just to, before I wrap it up completely, Stephanie, were there any other last minute questions that people had? No, I really didn't see anything come through new on the chat. Okay, well then I would like to thank ReadyTalk for sponsoring this webinar series. Uh, ReadyTalk has donated the use of their system to help TechSoup expand awareness of technology through the nonprofit sector. ReadyTalk helps nonprofits and libraries in the U.S. and Canada reach geographically dispersed areas and increase collaboration through their audio conferencing and web conferencing services. So this slide lists a special training that they offer to TechSoup customers. And I want to make sure that 